Elmer Leonard is here. He is the author of numerous best-selling novels, including Be Cool, Out of Sight, and Get Shorty. Known for his dead-on dialogue and razor-sharp wit, Leonard has been praised by the New York Times as the greatest crime writer of our time. His new book is called When the Women Come Out to Dance. It is his first collection of short stories and the first time that one of his works has been adapted for the stage. I am pleased to have him back at this table for, what, the tenth time, you think? I would say about that. I would that. say about yeah. that. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good about getting you on in front of America. You're, you're, you've been a... A pal. Pal is yeah. what I would say, too. Yeah. Now, why did you decide to do this, this collection of short stories? Well, they were, the, they were available, and I thought, well, I'll do a few more, and it'll, it'll become a book size, mm -hmm. and that'll be part of the contract, then, with uh, HarperCollins. And uh, there are several stories in there that I didn't think had gotten enough attention mm -hmm. up till now, and this would be a good, good opportunity. There are some people who say that you've created your most compelling female characters here. Well, I think, you see, one of the short stories was, a, for example, uh, Karen Makes Out, was a test. I tested Karen in that situation to see if she would work in a book. This is Karen and, Sisko, Sisko of Out of Sight. Of Out of Sight. Uh, Charlie Hoke becomes a character in uh, Tishomingo Blues. Right. And I, see, I find out if they can talk or not in, in uh, you know, give them a little, uh, an audition. It's like an audition. You, you uh, actually said that Tishomingo Blues was your favorite book of all time. I did. And you still believe that? Well, I'll, I'll, it's up there with Freaky Deaky. Freaky Deaky. <laughs> it's one of my faves. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think my women in the last few books, well, I'd say in the last dozen books, have been very strong characters, and, and I have been leaning more toward making the, the women more important, and they turn out to be uh, more intelligent than the men, and, and even funnier, more interesting, and so therefore that their roles uh, become more important. A lot of people say that great writers never let their technique show. Does your technique show? Well, I say that my style is the absence of style, and yet it is obvious, because people say they can tell by reading a, a passage uh, that I wrote it. I mean, when they read one of the, my books, they know it's my book and not someone else's book. Is that good? Sure. I think it's good. Yeah, because yeah. it, it has a certain style, a certain zing. Because it has a certain sound, whether sound. it's a zing or I think of style as sound. And, and, what it, and this comes out of attitude. It's the, my attitude toward the characters in letting the characters tell the story, letting the characters, each scene is seen from a character's point of view. Your friend, Martin Amos. Martin Amos. Martin Amos says that you pushed the novel, the, the narrative in your novels, and that it is characters rather than the language that drives the narrative. Well, it's the language of the character, it's the language that makes the character. And this is something I learned back in 1954 in the, in the, uh, the uh, prologue of Steinbeck's Sweet Thursday. And in the prologue, a character from Cannery Rose says, yeah, I like that book, okay, but I didn't like the way he's always, he was, the author's always describing what people look like. I don't want to know what people look like. I want to know, I don't want him telling me what they look like. I want to learn from the way they talk and what they do what they look like. And I've never forgotten that, because I would certainly rather do it that way than have to try and describe characters, because I think more often than not, describe, uh, characters are described far too much in detail in novels. That the little physical uh, uh, characteristics that, you, that uh, you don't remember. Well, unless somebody has said that you can be, I would dif disagree on this point. point. You can be so brilliant at the way you do that. I mean, it can be your long suit. Exactly. And you, you can. You, yes. Somebody like that can set a scene, and they have such a capacity to recreate a scene. They see everything that it makes it more vibrant. Well, th that's true. I've, I've said, for example, one of my rules is never open a book with the weather. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but there are certain <laughs> <What's true? coughs> writers who can describe all the weather they want. 
you know, because they're good at it. Yeah. They can do weather reports. You're talking about this to every person. Since you brought this up, I'm going to pick at some of these other things. Number two is how to avoid prologues. Avoid prologues. Avoid prologues, except Be in the case of uh, Steinbeck, where he gave me all that valuable information in his prologue. You say a prologue in a novel is a backstory, and you drop it in anywhere you want, mm -hmm. but not at the beginning. But you say no. You just say avoid them. Avoid them, because a prologue, is, you, you, get, read, you open the book and say, a prologue. Oh, do I have to read the prologue? Why can't I just get into the story? Yeah. Never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. Now, what would be an example of a verb of a, of a verb you would use to carry a dialogue other than said? Um, I'm not sure if I'm going or not. She is separated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or she ad libbed or <laughs> or yeah, you know, right. She reflected. Yeah. <laughs> what was the word you used? A separated. A se what does that mean? I'm not sure. I've forgotten, but I had Mary <laughs> McCarthy used it, and I had to look it up. <laughs> when, if you have to look up the verb, yeah. you know that you're looking up words all through that book. You, you say never use an adverb to modify the verb said. Never. Never say, for example, he admonished gravely. Mm -hmm. Never. Never. He admonished. That's enough. Right, me too. I'm with you on this. You could write for me. <laughs> what do you pay? <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as you make. <laughs> Never use the word suddenly or all hell broke loose. Yes, and you see those all the time. <clears throat> now, I, you don't have to explain those. Mm. All right. You know. Number seven, use regional dialect sparingly. Did you skip uh, exclamation points? No, I skipped uh, patas. Hmm? No, I skipped, how do I pronounce this? P-A-T-O-I-S. Patois. Patois. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, the rule is use regional dialect, patois, sparingly. Well, you don't want the, the, the book, if you use dialect, your, 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 your page is all full of uh, apostrophes, you know, where you're leaving out letters and things, or you're, you're, you're spelling phonetically, and it looks funny. You've got to use that sparingly. Avoid detailed descriptions of characters. We've talked about this a little bit, but... Unless... Unless... What? Unless you're, uh... Hemingway. <laughs> unless... No, I, he doesn't... I know, see that he It's didn't, a perfect example, right? Yeah. It's a perfect example of the rule. Avoid detailed descriptions. Exactly. Uh, go on. <laughs> All right. Don't go into great detail describing places and things. Unless... Unless you're Margaret Atwood. Yeah. And can... This is my point. I've already made this point. Yeah. And can paint scenes with language or write landscapes in the style of Jim Harrison. Yeah. But even if you're good at it, you don't want descriptions that bring the action, the flow of the story, to a standstill. Okay. Let me go back to avoid detailed descriptions of characters. Steinbeck covered. In Ernest Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants, what do the American and the girl with him look like? She had taken off her hat and put it on the table. That's the quote. That's the only reference to a physical description in the story, and yet we see the couple and know them by their tone of voice, with not one adverb in sight. Right out Amen. of your mouth. Amen. All right. right. <clears throat> Number ten. What? Wait. What about exclamation points? I don't see that. That couldn't have been left out. No, I made a mistake or somewhere. I, I, you know, I don't know where it is. But well, you, you explain it to me then. Well. Exclamation points are often used. The exclaimer is put when this when the sentence doesn't isn't exclaiming anything. It's just that the writer, I think, gets a little heated, a little excited about it, and he puts in he puts in the exclamation point. But I I say that you're allowed maybe three per hundred thousand words when you're really? writing a book, unless you're Tom Wolf. Then you can throw them in for fun. Why, unless you're Tom Wolfe? Because Tom Wolfe knows how to use them for fun. For fun, right, okay. Yeah. Try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. Yes. If you know that a reader's going to skip it, don't put it in. Exactly. And I came across that one in a, in a crossword puzzle yeah. in uh, USA Today. And it said, begin Elmore Leonard uh, quote here. And I thought, well, what? What could it be until I got... I try, and then I knew what it was, of course. That's, a, that's my oldest rule. Try to leave out the parts that readers tend to skip. There's one more. 
and you say this is my most important rule and it sums up all of the ten. What is it? <laughs> uh, if, <it's coughs> if it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. I don't, it, and what I, I'm referring to the way we were taught to write by putting the dependence sentence uh, clause first, you know, like upon entering the room, he noticed that that to me is just writing. Some of the reviewers, like Kirkus, they liked uh, the short stories better than the novellas. Do you? You mean in general? All no, here. Oh, in here. Yeah. All, oh, all. Oh. Because the two of these are longer than the rest. Right. Yeah. Well, that's okay. It's <laughs> what 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 can I say? I'll tell you. You know what? My favorite one is is the Tonto Woman. Really? And I wrote it ten years ago. Why is that your favorite? I just like it. It, it I, counts a rustler's determined courtship of a landowner's. Well, do you think that's what it's about? No. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about? It's about a, a rustler's courtship of a land, but that's not what it's about. What's it about? Well, here, here, this this Mexican rustler, and he goes he in the the first scene he goes to confession. It's the first time in twenty years he's gone to confession. And he says, oh, I've stolen 5,000 horses and so many, you know, all this, this get this all right. off his chest. All right. right. Then he goes, he goes out toward the herd, uh, and he sees this woman, you know, sh who must be living in this line shack out on this very uh, empty prairie out there. And he sees her come out to the uh, pump, and she's washing herself. And she has a suspicion that she's being watched. Then he comes in to get a drink of water. And she's at, in the doorway with a gun. And there's something strange about her. And she's tattooed on her face with blue lines. Blue lines uh, because she had been captured by Tano Mojaves and mm -hmm. sold to them by another tribe as a slave. And they tattooed her so that she would look like one of them. Yeah. And when she was, when she was uh, finally saved and returned to the home, her husband puts her out in this line shack to live. And, and she doesn't want to see anybody because she's, well, because, this, because of these blue lines on her face, see? But, but this Mexican drover, he says, hey, come on. He gets her, he buys her a new hat and a dress and he takes her into town so that she can... Uh, become herself again. There's a little action in it, but not, not any shooting. But I think, the, I think it's a good story. I think it could be a movie. Okay, why did you choose this one for the cover and for the title, When the Women Come Out to Dance? I was going to use Ten Killer. And uh, my publisher, my editor, uh, Marjorie Brayman, said, I think When the Women Come Out to Dance would be a much, much more intriguing. It's kind of a snappy title, isn't it? Yeah. And I said, I think you're right. And I did, immediately, there, almost immediately. Here you go. There you are. The, when the women come out to dance, Elmore Leonard, thank you for being with us. Charlie, thank pleasure you. Pleasure to have you. Always my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Well, in front of America. You're, you're, you've been a, a pal. Pal uh, is yeah. what I would say, too. Yeah. Now, why did you decide to do this, this collection of short stories? Well, they were, the, they were available. And I thought, well, I'll do a few more, and it'll, it'll become a book size. Mm -hmm. And that'll be part of the contract then with uh, Harper Collins. And uh, there are several stories in there that I didn't think had gotten enough attention mm. up till now, and this would be a good, good opportunity. There are some people who say that you've created your most compelling. Elmer Leonard is here. He is the author of numerous best selling novels, including Be Cool, Out of Sight, and Get Shorty. Known for his dead on dialogue and razor sharp wit, Leonard has been praised by the New York Times as the greatest crime writer of our time. His new book is called When the Women Come Out to Dance. It is his first collection of short stories and the first time that one of his works has been adapted for the stage. I am pleased to have him back at this table for what, the tenth time you think? I, mean? I would say about that. I would that. say about yeah. that. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good about getting you on female characters here. Well, I think 
You see, one of the short stories was, a, for example, uh, Karen Makes Out, was a test. I tested Karen in that situation to see if she would work in a book.